Um, so, Margaret, there's a lot of emphasis these days on technology for the future of work and society. What do you think is being left out of that conversation so far that we should be taking into account? Um, I think there's a lot of emphasis on what computers can do and I think a little less on what they can't do and or what technology can't do. And so I've been pondering that. That's kind of the question that's been going around my mind uh, recently is, um, you know, uh, and I know there's Watson and there's various, you know, um, computers that can pull together vast amounts of intelligence in an analytical way, in a way that your human brain can as well. But uh, I think... Uh, so I think the emphasis on... Uh, the kind of jobs that where where caring, where empathy, where human interaction, where creativity, uh, uh, that's that's kind of missing from the from the uh, conversation. I think the conversation has always been about what what is computers replacing, rather than what should we be doing that they they can't do. Thank you, um, and maybe this next question follows on from that. But there's a lot of gee wizardry with technology. And um, sometimes we can get a little bit carried away with the technology. Um, how do you sift out the stuff that turns everybody's head but um, doesn't necessarily deliver real or adequate value? And, and how do you have a little bit of healthy scepticism when new technologies become available without missing the boat? Oh, you su surround yourself with really smart people who, who, who give you good advice on that. Um, so uh, I think... Uh, I think it's pretty easy to get carried away and um, I think part of that, uh, the story that we had at Melbourne and I think in our approach here is that that the people that have really driven the, the, way, the way we went are people that have been immersed in questions of pedagogy and, 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 and learning long before and long after I have uh, so that I was able to draw on really good expertise in working on the way forward and not get distracted by the sort of the external forces that were predicting things that we weren't, um, uh, that predicting things that actually weren't going to happen, you know, because of the potential of this new technology. I think the other thing was that um, it's always good to be able to step back. And so my experience of coming back into um, into sort of the teaching and learning space of universities after 10 years out was uh, some things had changed dramatically and some things hadn't changed at all. And so my kind of, you know, um, the para being able to step back from the sort of over, you know, the, the gee wizardry and say, well, is there really something here and being, a, you know, the scientist with the healthy scepticism. Mm -hmm. Asking the right questions. Yes. Um, now, it was very interesting to see the different perceptions of the... I guess the penetration of online education from around the world in, that, in those graphs that you showed us. Um, are you in a position to share what percentage of um, revenue comes to QT through online courses now and where you might see that shifting by, say, 2030? Um, no. no. <laughs> but if you could, <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> Well, it's not a figure that I have in my head. I don't know whether Susie's got it in, or in her head, but um, certainly we would. Um, it's it's, rel it's because we don't have very many wholly online off offerings at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's small, yeah. so uh, and so. But w do we have online dimensions to large numbers mm -hmm. of our courses? Of course we do, and that's increasing. So I guess if we were to uh, I, what I have been saying in terms of our revenue is that we need to shift to have uh, slightly less dependence on uh, undergraduates you know, um, coming into the university. It needs to be more in the postgraduate taught space and online will be part of that. And, and increasingly we'll see examples like the education one where we've got um, tasters, uh, small, um, small bites of post-professional training and whether that gets to be, I, I just, I, you know, I just don't want to set the hairs running in terms of how much of our revenue that might be, because it would be a very unscientific answer if I gave it to you now. Okay. I don't well, know whether Susie wants to... Where are you, Susie? Would you like to make a comment? 
add one, of course, Margaret, that's perfect. But I suppose what we do know, having not put a great deal of emphasis on online or external students, is that they are already one of our fastest growing cohorts. Uh, and those are some of the things that have made us understand that we have more to do in that space. So perhaps a somewhat related question then is about um, length of program. So could either you or Susie hazard a guess at the average length of um, program for students engaged at QUT now? And given, I guess, the, the trend towards instant gratification, um, but also just the fact that the time invested in a you know, four years in education is a long time and the workplace is changing faster than that sometimes. So what's, what do you have a sense of what the length of engagement might be in, say, again, in 2030 compared to what it might be now on average? Um, I'll start and I might throw to Susie if she's got better insights than me. Look, I think, I think the, the core undergraduate experience, whatever that looks like, and it'll be a mixture of... Um, a lot of what we do today and some things that we do differently will will still be there and where the where the shortened and in and out activities will be are in the post professional so either and when i say post professional that means not even necessarily a postgraduate program that trains you to be a doctor or an engineer but something after that and and so i think there's uh, a whole lot of things that as i said um, are not content related that make up the learner experience in those early years, so I can't see too much of that. Mm -hmm. And where you do provide opportunities for students to accelerate, they don't always take them up because mm -hmm. they're, um, they're, you know, they're working, they're doing other things. We want them doing um, sporting or, or entrepreneurship activities on campus as well. Excellent. We might open it up to the audience um, to ask a question or two. Um, if you do have a question, if you could put your hand up and we'll have one of our roving mics come to you. And then throughout the day, if you do ask a question, could you start by introducing yourself and make sure, make sure that you do actually ask a question? Okay. And then one at, one at the front here. Um, so you've, uh, Margaret, you spoke a lot about uh, adapting the, the academic and the learning. Um, how do you see, particularly when we've got more online students, those, those caring parts, the professional services, the counselling, the equity, how do you see that uh, scaling up as the online academic stuff goes? Thank you, Sam. Um, so the, uh, some of the online uh, master's programs that are offered in the US in the... In, and in, in Australia, actually have managed to scale up the, the experiential components of that as well at, at a distance. And so, so there are some things that just do not translate to an online e e experience because you, you, you actually have to get into a classroom and you know, f face the students or you have to get into a clinic and, and learn to deal with patients. And so what the, one of the most successful online programs in in the US is the Master of Teaching at University of Southern California. And they've got thousands of students in that program. And what they've done is they've then created sort of hubs of uh, teaching practice all around the US to enable people to do that. And I think partly I, I've been reflecting on that figure about Australians, academics feeling there's going to be more online than their counterparts in North America and Europe is I think there is a feeling that the distance, the tyranny of distance in Australia will lend itself to more online experiences. And we've then got to just think how we can um, do that. And, but also recognise that some of the delivery of our healthcare, for example, will be done remotely. And so scaling up our health, uh, skilling up our health professionals so they can do uh, telemedicine or tele kind of consult consultations is also an aspect. Thank you for the question. If I could have a mic quickly to the front of the room. Gentleman in the check shirt, please. Table nine. And then one last question over here. Thank you. Well, that was largely my question that was just asked to you before, Margaret. However, one thing I'd like to... Your name? Uh, my name's Philip from IoT Skills Australia. Thank you. One thing I'd like to look into, I totally agree with you on the uh, core post or sorry, undergraduate, so your bachelor degrees being kept um, at university and quite traditional. 
but something I see in the workforce planning space would be online micro courses, professional development for your graduates, so post-grad, um, maybe four-hour courses even, something that bring you up to speed on a certain technology or something happening in that industry or space. I'd love to see QUT as an alumni member engage on that level. I think it's in the plans. So I'm looking at Susie and she's nodding. <laughs> Stay tuned. You are, you're on the alumni database, I presume? Great. Our, our last question before morning tea. Hi, I'm Karen Whelan, the Assistant Dean Learning and Teaching in the Science and Engineering Faculty here. Um, there's just been a, a, um, a, a, an article recently in Times Higher Ed reporting on a research study at a, a UK university. And the first line is that uh, says, students taught by traditional methods are less likely to contemplate dropping out of university. Essentially, the study found that students who experienced lectures were less likely to want to drop out. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Margaret, in following up about talking about lectures, why you think that might be. And also, do you think when we're thinking about disruptive influences, we really do have to divide um, school leavers doing their first undergraduate degrees from professionals? Um, that's a complex question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer other than about the lecture attendance, um, a, other than it does create a social connection, you know, and so uh, the, um, and, and it's still an infinitely better experience than listening to the hours of lecture capture online. It's not necessarily a better experience than a a really well-designed seven-minute video with assessment in, a, in the new pedagogy, but it's definitely better than um, having listened to my daughter listen to her e e echo, e you know, echo three six online lectures. Um, but so that's one point: is I think it's about the social connection um, and uh, as, as much as the content delivery. The second question about the different. Uh, segments of learners. I think that's that's what learning analytics is telling us. The different learners learn dif different segments of our cohorts are, are different, and um, uh, we need to cater for that in a flexible way. Well, thank you very much. Please join me in uh, thanking Professor Margaret Scheel. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for uh, starting us off today on our, our theme of adaptation and contemplating adapting how we learn and obviously adapting how QT teaches as well. We're now going to break uh, for morning tea and if I could ask you to... Um